Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this D-Zone fireside chat on how to go pipeline free with real-time analytics, sponsored by Seller Data. Today, we'll dive into the fascinating world of real-time analytics and explore a groundbreaking concept, pipeline-free real-time analytics, an approach that promises simplicity and improved efficiency for organizations. I'm Jesse, Chief Technologist at DZone, and I am thrilled to be moderating this discussion with some esteemed experts in the field of data analytics. We have the privilege of having Andy Oliver, Director of Marketing, hey, Andy, and Sita Chen, Product Marketing Manager, both from Seller Data. Sita, as our esteemed experts. Their expertise and insights will guide us through the world of real-time analytics and share some actionable examples from successful companies like Airbnb who've embraced this idea of pipeline-free analytics. If you find today's session valuable and want to explore more exciting events like this, head on over to dzone.com slash events where you can access all of our on-demand content. Now, in today's fast-paced data-driven world, Analytics is important. It plays a pivotal role in making critical business decisions and monitoring our applications. There's a lot of different applications for this thing. So we want to drive right into the topic. And Andy and Sita, could you define real-time analytics for our audience? And how does it differ from this idea of traditional analytics? Sure. So the value of data as we know, decreases over time. So if you, you know, the information that's freshest is the most valuable. Always, yeah. Rather than doing retrospective analysis and, and what have you, um, and think how we can do better next time, you can take action where there's a, still a chance to make a difference. So something happens, we look at that across our whole system with all of the, uh, all of the other data and say, okay, this is the state of things right now. There are a lot of different industries and business cases where this isn't just a nice to have, it's essential. So if you're doing mm -hmm. something like IoT or uh, ad tech or, or something like that, um, a lot of those cases, this is, uh, this is now. Now, real-time analytics is relatively simple at a small scale. Um, we've, we've all done that, I think, at this point. Um, however, if you look at big, massive scale, this gets a lot harder. So one of our uh, one of the users of uh, Star Rocks in uh, China is uh, uh, Xiao Hongshu, and they're basically a giant social media platform with hundreds of millions of uh, mm. uh, uh, active uh, users. So a, a lot of times, some of these things uh, over there are at an even bigger scale than you'll see over here, um, right. uh, just for population. Uh, advertisers run ads on it, um, and that's the main way they make revenue. So you can kind of think of it as uh, ad tech in that way. And, you know, some of the things they want to do is monitor the performance of the ads uh, and use it to tune things like the recommendation algorithm. Um, they've also got external facing analytics. So advertisers want to see how well their ads are doing and they're probably not waiting to find that out at the end of the month anymore. So oh. they want to see right now, how are my ads doing? So the value of the real-time data is as long as the ads are running, it costs money. Uh, the fresher the data, the faster everyone can react, thus in a way preventing losses and increasing everyone's profitability. Now, when you think about this, though, um, uh, to make that happen, your analytics system has to take in data in real time. So it's got to be able to handle, you know, inserts and upserts and 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 changes the data uh, in real time and a massive amount of concurrency. And traditional analytic systems don't handle concurrency well. It used to be if somebody asked me, I'd say analytical systems uh, have one user querying a lot of data and uh, transactional systems have lots of users querying very little data. Well, now we have analytical systems where you have lots of users querying lots of data. Um, so doing it in real time is really about shrinking that time between when the data comes in and when somebody actually analyzes and look at, looks at the data. Because time, cause time yeah. is money and it's valuable, right? Um, yeah. Sita, what do you see on your side? Yeah, so um, we're probably gonna 
talk a little more on the technical side, right? So how is uh, your real-time analytics different uh, from a like traditional batch uh, analytics, right? And I think the ultimate goal of you know real-time analytics is you know it's not only to have fresher data, is it's actually the entire pipeline from data generation all the way to you know to actionable insight to action to actually make a difference, right? When is when it's still you know, not too late, right? And uh, this whole pipeline consists of many different steps, right? From data generation to data transformation. Uh, to data ingestions, this is sometimes optional, but, uh, you know, and to analytics and to, you know, visualization or, you know, automated decision-making, you know, from another software or another application, right? And each step of that needs, you know, to be really fast in order to meet uh, the the business needs, uh, the, the tight uh, time constraint, right? And, um, and this time constraint often, really often, Requires spe uh, specialized tools uh, to to tackle these problems, right? And uh, let's take you know ingestion, uh, for example, right? Ingestion into your OLAP system. OLAP systems are designed to run complex, you know, aggregated queries at scale, right? So they're often columnar storage. So they store data in a columnar format, right? And in big chunks, right? And uh, updates or data inserts are you know by row. So it's really difficult to do them in a short, you know, in a, in a very short interval and very frequently. For big batches, they're okay, right? And especially when you put in, you know, data upserts and, you know, how to upsert a, how to change a, uh, a tablet inside, you know, your storage engine. And that's a huge challenge, right? And apart from that, you know, is the whole pipeline, the query is um, the query side is important too, right? You need to have very low latency to to meet the time constraint, right? And for a batch job, you know, back in the day, we we're using you know Hadoop, run a map reduce job, you you know, run the job and go get a coffee, get a solid pizza, take a five hour nap. That's you're probably still running. I'll be okay <laughs> with it, right? And but for real time analytics, it's really not the not the thing. So the whole pipeline from the beginning to end is all different from traditional analytics and we can kind of unwrap that as we go uh, in this in this talk i love that and it's funny you said you know back in the day i'm like that was yesterday man <laughs> yeah. it was dbase and fox <laughs> yeah. pro in like 1996 he yeah. knows what i'm talking about um <laughs> yeah. and, but you're right data's changed a ton since then yeah right and so you this the idea of database specialization right we went in the 90s and the early 2000s to the big oracles and SQL servers of the world, and you're trying to do everything against them, you know, and not mostly designed for transactional, then you've mm -hmm. got your OLAP databases, a lot like what you got for analytics, columnar storage and stuff. You've got some, you know, your relational databases, um, which are storing, you know, different relationships for like social networks, um, Hadoop, which to me, I still thought was new. Thanks for making me feel old, Sita. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, but I want to jump, if we can, uh, and take, take a minute and talk through pipelines, right? This idea of data pipelines has been around forever, forever. And it is. It's a critical thing in real-time analytics. But tell me how we got here. Like, why now have they become this source of complexity and expense and we're innovating on that side? Like, how do we get here? Yeah, so uh, pipeline in, in terms of real time and uh, batch analytics are different, right? And real time, you expect everything to run really fast. So there's typically not much going on in there, but doing everything in real time is expensive, right? Let's take a step back and talk about, you know, uh, joins and denormalization, normalized tables, right? Normalized tables means um, you store your data into multiple tables and, you know, have relationships uh, between them, right? And that has been the, you know, a good practice or the standard since the invention of database management system. That was probably in the 1970s, right? And just say you have, uh, you know, like an order table, right, with a customer ID. And you would have another customer table, you know, storing all of the customer detailed information and have an ID in that table linked to the to the customer ID in the order table. And that's considered, you know, that's still considered a good practice and the de facto way of doing analytics or or storing data, right? And uh, you know, data is normalized in this natural format in a star or in a snowflake schema, right? Mm -hmm. But in real time, OLAP space, uh, that's kind of different. 
because a lot of the OLAP databases, real-time OLAP databases are not uh, optimized for join operations or multi-table join queries, complex queries, right? And uh, so the database actually rely on the data practitioner, on the user to do the normalization before the normalization of the data before it hits your OLAP serving layer, your real type OLAP serving layer, right? So basically to pre-join multiple tables into a flat table, your, you know, destroy your star or snowflake schema <laughs> into a flat table schema. And uh, yeah, and uh, that is a huge pain because um, doing everything stream or, you know, real time uh, uh, restraint Right, you cannot really use like traditional tools, like batch tools, like a Spark. You know, run a Spark job, right? On a partition, you do a partition swap, and that's not, you know, that's not really uh, viable. Uh, so people are turning into those uh, stream processing tools, where each every operation is incremental. Right, incremental means that uh, the amount of computations is only depends on the new data and not depend on the historical data, right? It's, so you only compute what's new, but those tools require specified, you know, specialized uh, engineering skills actually require coding, you know, in Java, in Scala, you know, and yes. um, there's, yeah, those are not that e easy to use. And, uh, you know, a stateful operation like a join or a big group by mm -hmm. um, in the stream processing tool, that's, that's not easy to maintain, you know, just select the right window size can be a pain, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this, I think, you know, makes the data pipeline or specifically pre-processing pipeline in real time analytics, the most expensive part or the most complexity, uh, the most complex part uh, in real time analytics. That's true. And, and the stream processing stuff was invented to solve some of those problems, but it yes, sounds like it's adding exactly. complexity. Yeah, it's adding complexity. It's turning people away uh, from doing real-time analytics because they yeah. need to do those big denormalization, like joining like a billion rows with a hundred a hundred million rows in a you know in a stream in a stream stateful stream processing job, and that's not easy to do. That's no, no it's not. And, yeah. it's, and and that's what's fascinating to me is I think through like you're saying Java and SQL, and I'm getting excited, you know, because yeah. I know how to do it that way, but it doesn't make it as usable for everybody. Yes. Which which I, I like where the conversation's going. And I want to dive a little bit deeper, if I can, into these challenges that we're facing with these traditional data pipelines. Like, how do they affect the overall performance of the real-time analytics? Yes. So what we just went through was a, you know, the pure technical part, right? Just to uh, to engineer, to implement that pipeline and how to maintain that pipeline, all the technical difficulties, right? But it actually is not good for your experience at all because when you denormalize something, you need to know your query pattern beforehand, right? And lock your data into a rigid single view format, right? And mm -hmm. every time you want to, you know, there's something changing in your business. You want to add a column to one of your 15 tables that you're drawing together beforehand, right? You need to reconfigure the entire pipeline. That's a lot of engineering effort. And also you need to backfill all of the data in. Just imagine you have like 100 terabytes of data. That's going to take hours to do, even with a big cluster, right? And that this really makes your, your analytics workflow well, rigid and not flexible, right? Really not good for real-time analytics where everything is changing so fast. I see that. And I thought it was funny. You said, but it's only a problem when there's a business change and reconfiguring them. What were you talking about? The businesses don't change often, do they? <laughs> they do. They do. I mean, you, yeah, I mean, they, of they, they, they do. And, and they do. should, because that's yeah. what it takes today to stay competitive. Right. Yeah. To add a column, that's not a big ask, right? Or to, you know, remove a column or, you know, change a data type or something. That's not a big ask. But if you build a denormalization pipeline, and that is technically a big ask, it, but it's it nor it's so normal in, in, you know, in everyday business, you know, you just change something, little things. Right? <laughs> so I, I want to keep, I want to keep digging here a little bit, if I can. Um, we, we had in the title this idea of pipeline free real time analytics. Yeah. We talked about analytics, how we got here, some of the big issues that we're having with it. But I want to know can you explain really to me, if you can, 
what that entails. Like, what is it? How does it simplify the process? Yeah, sure. So, um, so technology always involved, right? And uh, with a lot of the new tools at hand and with a lot of engineering effort from, you know, the database provider, it's actually entirely possible to do joins on the fly uh, instead of, you know, like pre-join everything and just, you know, do joins on your server, on, on your serving layer. Right. And uh, here I want to kind of introduce, you know, the database or the open source OLAP database, Starox. Right. Starox is, uh, is built uh, for this kind of workload. Right. Mm -hmm. It has a columnar storage and it's SIMD optimized. It has a, a Cosways optimizer, which is really important for, um, for, for large scale join operations. Right. It's completely MPP. It has an MPP uh, architecture. So it supports all kinds of join algorithms. Right. And, uh, and it's built to do joins on the fly in a real time environment. Right. And uh, yeah. And uh, let's, you know, you can take a look at some, uh, some benchmark here. So yeah. the first one is the SSB benchmark test. Right. SSB is, you know, if I want to conclude what that is, is basically for your, um, it's like mimicking like a reporting or dashboarding kind of scenario, right? Where the mm -hmm. queries are multi-table, but they're not that complex, right? And this is really um, a common, you know, representative uh, benchmark for real-time analytics use cases, right? And just be aware, there are actually two kinds, two, two variants of this SSB benchmark test. The first one is the original one with multiple table and you do it joins on the fly. Right, and because a lot of the uh, databases cannot do do join, and there is a variant actually made by the folks um, in ClickHouse, right, and so they denormalize the whole thing into a big uh, wide table and do single query uh, instead of multi -qu multi table query, right, and join is exp expensive, right, and now let's look at some uh, results, right, and you can see Star Rocks flat uh, and everything with a flat is saying that it's a sim single table, right? That big single everything, table, right? Yeah, everything's in single table. And yeah. when you say multi-table, Star Wars is the only one out there because Star Wars is actually the only one that can finish it. <laughs> it's multi-table, right? So am I reading this right in that Star Rocks is joining from multiple tables faster than Apache? Yeah, faster than Droid. Is, is almost doing, as, wow. Yes. Yeah, flat, almost as fast as ClickHouse, right? And okay. uh yeah, and in a single table test, we're, we're the fastest. And that's actually where ClickHouse shines. And uh, But for multi-table query, we're close. Uh, we're close to, to ClickHouse. And we're, we're, we're close to ClickHouse faster. in a single table. So yeah, in, in a single table. So it's not even a fair comparison. Yeah, yeah it's not and even it's a fair huge, comparison. And it's huge. And it's huge. These are yeah. giant. These are multiples of speeds, not like yes. 10%. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And the thing is that this by itself eliminates your denormalization pipeline, right? And uh, so you get all of the benefit of having the same schema uh, between your data source and your OLAP layer, right? And so you can do all of the change instant, instantly, instantly without like meddling with any kind of, you know, schema change uh, during the mm -hmm. pre-processing pipeline. And that is kind of huge, right? And yeah, it is a little slower than ClickHouse, you know, flat. But it's expected, right? Because join is a very expensive operation. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, but Starox and all of the other MPP, true MPP uh, architecture database are mm -hmm. built to scale horizontally, right? You add yeah. nodes, it's going to scale near linearly. So it's going to near linear scale, <laughs> right? Almost, almost linearly scale, right? <laughs> so you just take your, whatever you're spending on your data pipeline, Right, and redeploy that into more Star Wars, uh nodes, and it's gonna run faster, and it's gonna be cheaper, and your business is gonna be so much more flexible. Right, it's gonna be so much more flexible for your business change. Right, and uh, this is more like a you know more like a real time. Let's just for the fun of it, let's look at a TBCDS. TBCDS benchmark is for it's really representative for those really really heavy ETL workloads. Right, like, uh, like you know, three thousand line with many joins, many group buys, and very complex queries. Right, and this is on a terabytes of data, and we're five point five four times faster than Trino. And Trino is, you know, it's a data lake query query layer. Right, yep. and this is actually querying the same exact data set um, mm -hmm. on Apache Hive. Right, external data. 
and we're 5.5 times faster than Trino on those extreme uh, join um, complex queries, mm. right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this is, it sounds simple, right? <laughs> so <laughs> how do you do it? So, you know, you don't want pipeline, you just join on the flag, right? Uh, but for real time analytics, there are like more demanding scenarios, right? If you are like, you know, if you're serving like a, like Xiaohongshu, like the, the case we talked about before, right? They're serving a bunch of advertisers and they have uh, in the high hundreds of QPS on OLAP queries. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of QPS. That's a lot of queries for OLAP, right? Yes. Uh, like group by, group by queries. So, so, um, yeah, sometimes even, you know, with the best optimizer or with the best query layer, it's not really possible to keep up, you know, with hundreds of QPS, right? But there are other ways other than, you know, doing a, adding a stream processing tool to your data pipeline, right? And there is a thing called a partial update, right? And uh, so basically is, you know, say you have a hundred columns, right? And you have two streams, you know, like, like two Kafka topics you want to uh, denormalize into a big flat table, right? Instead of doing the denormalization in the separate job, right? You just, okay, a hundred columns and one stream updates the 50 and the other stream updates the other 50, right? Yeah. And this has been, yeah, this, it sounds simple, but it's not actually that easy to- <laughs> It was so easy when you said it. Yeah, it it's not that sense. easy. Because everything stores in a columnar format. Right. Everything stores in a columnar format. And this update to make that efficient enough to be, enough to, to for, for production use. It's not actually that simple, right? As far as I know, including Staros, there's only two databases that supports this and supports, uh, Staros supports the best out of all, right? And this is kind of like, you know, the, 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 the plan for, you know, the way to do it for uh, your high concurrency workloads, right? Where the requirement is so extreme that Staros can't even keep up, right? For commercial update. Um, yeah, and uh, and we can look at an example, right? Example of uh, Airbnb. Airbnb's uh, metric platform is called Minerva. And they actually holds, I think, from last year, six petabytes of data uh, in their metric platform. And before they were using Druid and Presto and Spark as their query layer, right? And the data is actually scattered all over the place. And uh, because Druid cannot really do uh, drawing very fast, so they needed to denormalize everything, right? Denormalize all of the tables into a big, uh, wide, wide table, flat table, right? And every time they want to change a column that's from them, every time they want to change a column, it takes hours or up to days to do it. And they spend so much engineering effort into uh, implementing and maintaining those denormalization pre-processing pipelines, right? And then they, moved to Starox and Starox became their kind of like a unified query layer, right? Because Starox is good at joins. So they just say, huh, we're just gonna do joins on the fly and get rid of all of the uh, the, the denormalized uh, pipelines, right? Mm -hmm. And by last year, actually, you know, they shared it, uh, it's a webinar with us and there's only 20% of the table that is still uh, norm uh, denormalized and all of the other tables are normalized and joins are done on the fly. So this saved them so much effort, right? Yeah. Uh, so they're actually doing joins on the fly joins on six petabytes of data. And, and architecturally, uh, it's much more simple. Yes, it's much it's more simplified simple. the architecture a lot. I love how Andy's grinning, but that's well, a huge but also deal. think about the cost. Think about yeah, the money cost. wise, yeah. Because if you're pre, when you query data, uh, or when you have an analytical system, most of the time, most of the data isn't even queried or isn't even read. Um, you know, it's it's the parts that people are interested in. Yeah. So if you're pre-joining that data um, in order for it to be efficient, um, you're basically going to pay. You, you just set some money on fire, uh, yep. create a nice hot <laughs> fire. Um, and with that nice hot money file, you bake your uh, data cake into a big flat uh, uh, table <laughs> Uh, so that, you know, some small percentage or in some cases, small percentage of it can actually get eaten. So uh, this saves your money fire. Uh, yeah. 
that's a big deal. And the whole idea of, of pipeline free, I'll be honest, I was skeptical. Um, it makes a lot of sense. It's sim- I like how it makes things more simple, right? The biggest issue that I see with software systems, especially data systems today, is they're, they, they keep getting more complex. And as we fight to make it more simple, it becomes more useful and faster, which I love, right? Um, and as we talk about Airbnb here, which is super exciting, and to be honest, a lot of people came here to hear this piece, right? See, is there anything else uh, you want to point out on this one? Because, you know, I was excited. Andy got to pipe in, and I want to ask him a question next. Yes. Uh, yeah, so for Airbnb, they have been using Starox for the past, uh, like, two, two years now. And uh, if you want to learn more about Airbnb's use case, you can hit up, you know, sellerdata.com slash blog. And there's a blog post and, oh, cool. you know, in the Seller Data YouTube, YouTube uh, uh, video. And there is one that did a webinar uh, with us and just talk about how they went pipeline free. Uh, with, awesome. With with Staras on their real time analytics workflow. And that's with their um, the Minerva uh, metric platform. And with their trust system, so anti-fraud kind of, you know, yep. that needs to be real time as well. Yeah. So yeah. welcome to check it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, Andy, you've been too quiet. I'm going to ask you a question, man. Um, I want you to explain how this whole pipeline free real time analytics really helps with efficiency in comparison to the traditional approach. I mean, we talked a little bit about some of the technical stuff. Give us some of the other stuff. One of the things in the Airbnb uh, webinar that they talk about is how long it used to take them to add uh, just a new metric. Um, So it used to take weeks. Now it doesn't. Um, So one of the things is things change. People want some new uh, analytics. They want to know some new things. Uh, Things evolve. People want to, you know, approach at least interactive analytics. Uh, being able to add a new column, being able to change something is huge. One of the things, you know, Sita mentioned the um, the uh, joins and and some of the uh, some of the other optimizations. Uh, another is being able to do pre-aggregations and things like that with materialized views. So rather than having to pre-aggregate, you can also just do that inside the database. Um, uh, just a, an aside for a strength of it. So getting rid of these denormalization pipelines uh, saves you the money I, I mentioned. So we can we can reduce we can get rid of our money fire that we uh, that we bake the cake with, which is a good um, thing. Yes, yes. Most people don't like money fires, um, but uh, 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 I you know I'm, I'm thinking of uh, some rap videos where they where they light the uh, cigar with one or something like that. But uh, but I think in general in business this is frowned it's upon. Frowned upon. Yes, frowned <laughs> yes. upon. Um, but think about this, think of the, uh, the, you know, the poor guys maintaining these platforms and having to handle all of these different denormalization platforms, the timing of the jobs, all of the different stuff that they have to do to make this stuff work. That stuff's complex. It's brittle. And whenever you have a lot of new moving parts, a lot of things break. Um, so, uh, so keeping it simple um, means it's keeping it more reliable, means fewer calls in the middle of the night. Um, and if you have your table schema roughly the same or similar to what you have at your uh, at your initial source with no transformation during this uh, pre-processing, whenever you need to make a change, it's simple. Um, you add a column over here, you add a column over here, uh, life is is far, far easier. Easy scheme of changes, moving at the speed of business. I like it. Yeah, Being able to change allows our business to change to what I was joking with Sita earlier about um, because businesses do change and we have to make those things fast and then reducing the maintenance. We always underestimate how much it takes to maintain some of these pipelines, right? And we joke about the money fire and the money fire in terms of platforms and additional query layers and stuff we were talking about with Druid and Presto and Spark. Yeah. But but the people cost, the human cost of someone having to investigate that stuff is huge. Um, yeah. And Andy, give me some ideas. Like I want, I want those out there listening. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Um, I want them to have some actionable steps. Like how yeah. would you, what would you recommend for organizations who have seen this and they're like, okay, I'm ready to work on some pipeline free stuff. 
uh, it sounds great. What do they, yeah. what do they do next? Yeah. So, I mean, I think everyone should investigate reducing the complexity of their systems by having a database that can do joins and do materialized view. Hopefully they pick star rocks, but uh, Hey, it's open source. Um, but um, uh, I think one of the big things to think about is whether or not real time's right for you first. Um, so in, in some, if, and I think in the U S we tend to batch a little more. I think if you're in a, in a, a, faster moving developing economy or whatever, and you didn't have any analytics, you go straight to real time because why wouldn't you kind of thing. Yeah. But if you're already there, if you're already doing analytics, you should evaluate the business case and say, does this, does, how can the benefit, the business benefit from real time? And you need to think outside the box because sometimes it's like, well, we've always done this kind of batching and what have you. And that's just how it works. But it's like, not that many years ago, when you shipped a package, you could get the tracking information, but it kind of showed you when it had shipped. It showed you when it had arrived at your local uh, shipping center, and it showed you when it was delivered. Nothing in between. You had no idea where it was or when it would get there um, uh, in reality. And, and now we take for granted these new kinds of capabilities. So think outside the box, um, uh, but how can the business benefit from going real time? Then you need a database technology that can handle inserts, upserts, and concurrency. If you've got something that's totally inflexible and you have to do it in this uh, pre-cooked format, then um, then you're not going to be able to do this. You want to look at joins and materialize view and ELT as opposed to ETL. EL, ELT is extract load transform. So basically doing the transforms inside the database versus having this transformation pipeline. Uh, as the data gets there, it gets transformed inside the database. This is going to be a lot faster than doing it in steps and uh, uh, across uh, several different uh, tools. Yeah. Um, so ELT can be essential if you want fresh data, lower operating costs in the real, in real time. Um, uh, because one of the things we were talking about is these different transformation pipeline steps, they all take time. So if I got data over here, I do all these different transforms to flatten it out by the time it even gets the database and we haven't even queried it yet, it's old. Right. Um, uh, so, hey, you need to be able to do these things. We hope you pick Starox, of course, um, and you can deploy operationally in the cloud uh, such as Stellar Data's BYOC offering of uh, bring your own cloud offering of Starox. Um, you also want to consider lock-in. Um, I always favored open source because uh, I don't want uh, somebody to uh, to pull the rug out from under me at some point. Yep. Um, I think I still like. I think I still have like OS two flashbacks or something. I, I, oh, I so oh, so, so, you so just dated both of us. Yeah, I have <laughs> OS two flashbacks where things just you know directions changed and things went sideways and yep. then uh, then if you were on that and it was then abandoned and then you were like okay what do I do now rewrite everything. Um, I'm not going to talk about 1632 bit thunking because that oh that'll my just goodness. OS2 uh, reference in OS2 or OS2 warp was enough. Thank you. <laughs> um, so look at your sources, look at how you feed your data to the analytic systems. This may, may mean something like a cop. So if you're going from batch to real time Kafka or Flink or something yeah. to ensure your data makes it to your operational system and your analytical system uh, in the time you need or both at the same time or one than the other. Uh, and then consider user experience. Look at real time dashboards, user facing analytics. So maybe right now um, you've got everything where uh, some uh, some analysts run these batch reports at the end of the month. Well, what if you, and what are they doing? Well, they're informing the customer or something like that. Well, what if you just let the customer look? Um, then uh, would you have to do all that? Consider interactive analytics. So uh, uh, this is kind of on top of the real-time experience where I let somebody be able to just explore because my, my database can handle it, right? I let somebody explore rather than I have to go create these pre-cook reports and run them in batch or whatever. I let them just drag and drop and what have you. If you can do joins and some of those things, you can consider that kind of experience. Now, what about smaller companies, right? A lot of this stuff, it's big, it's open source. It's going to need some people to kind of monitor it and use it, maybe even maintain it. What about smaller companies with more limited resources? 
So, I mean, with this new technology, the cost of goods and services go down. So any place where we talk about better performance, we show you benchmarks and we say, oh, look how much faster that is. That's also look how much cheaper that is, because it means you need less servers to achieve the same performance. Yeah. Um, uh, so pipeline free real time analytics are eliminating denormalization or any of this stateful uh, streaming stateful operation, the pre processing stage. All of these remove the biggest factor that contribute to differences in cost between real-time analytics and batch analytics. So this stuff makes it accessible for smaller organizations, less well-funded organizations to where right now, the reason they're not doing it real-time is because it costs too much. Yep. Well, we just brought the cost down by a lot, um, uh, you know, potentially hundreds of percent. Um, well, maybe you can actually do real-time now. Um, without a streaming pipeline to maintain, without having to, that's the other thing is you don't have as many people to do these things. So without a streaming pipeline, without having, uh, while having the flexibility to perform schema changes, um, uh, without reconfiguring the pipeline and doing all the data backfilling. So this makes this way more accessible to a lot more businesses. Yes, your Airbnbs picked it because they can sit there and say, okay, yes, we want to do this faster. Yes. Uh, we want to maintain less complexity. Yes, we want more real time or what have you. Right. Um, but a huge motivation is, yes, we don't want all these extra servers because um, when you run at the scale of an Airbnb uh, and I say I can cut, you know, 25 or however many percent servers, um, right. this, you know, a uh, few hundred million here, a few hundred, no, yeah, a million here, a million there, that adds up real quick to some real money, right? Um, it does. Uh, so, uh, uh, so at the smaller scale, this, uh, makes this kind of technology, this kind of real time, and it makes new business models, uh, more possible. Awesome. And I know we're running low on time. So, uh, we do have your slide on, uh, different resources where people, those of you out there who want to learn more about this topic, you know, website, blog, um, there's a free trial, Slack URL, all kinds of stuff. Um, they can connect directly with you two guys. Um, and we'll put that information out there. Uh, but the last question I do want, I do want one more, uh, to hear from y'all. Like what advice would you give to the people in the business who are leading the data initiatives for these organizations that are just beginning to explore real time analytics? Like let's, let's leave everybody with that so we can start to get started. So although real-time analytics has become a lot cheaper, there's still uh, some extra costs associated with it. So first, evaluate whether your business would benefit from going uh, from batch to real-time. Um, yes, eliminating all these pipelines makes it a lot easier, a lot cheaper, a lot more feasible, but hey, it still costs more to do real-time than batch. Sure. Um, there's some really clear-cut industries where real-time is a clear winner, IoT. Um, smart grids, uh, ad tech, uh, gaming. One of the biggest users of Star Rocks in China uh, is Tencent. They use it on like the oh, biggest yeah. game in the world. Um, logistics. So anytime you're tracking assets in real time, uh, manufacturing where you've got real time supply chain, factory control systems, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, uh, you know, financial transactions, including crypto, um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the crypto uh, uh, industry likes to use a technology like Star Trek, uh, Star Trek, Star Rocks to um, uh, yes, yes, like Star Trek. You know, <laughs> Star Rocks is like Star Trek technology here. Um, it beams your data up, um, but wow. uh, they like to use technology like Star Rocks to look through the blockchain and analyze the blockchain and, and figure all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, ultimately, the, it's just like any financial transactions or something where you need it at high volume and you need to know what's happening uh, now for whether it be um, money laundering, fraud detection, any of that kind of stuff. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us. We had a great discussion. Started out at the beginning, kind of technical. Seated, walked us through a bunch of different things on the technical side and then more on the business side. But the biggest thing for me to take away was the significance and feasibility of this idea of going pipeline free. 
So thank you, Andy. Thank you, Sita, for sharing your expertise and experiences. And special thank you to Seller Data for sponsoring this chat. As you all out there continue your journey in the world of data analytics, we encourage you to explore the ideas discussed today and apply them at your own company. If you enjoyed our discussion again and want to see more events like this, just go to dzone.com slash events to see all of our on-demand content. Also, if you will, please stay with us for just another minute, take a quick survey. Uh, just like your data pipelines, we're always looking to be more efficient and to improve and see how we can do better. Thank you everyone for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Jesse. Bye-bye.